During our month-long stay in Belgrade, the capital of Serbia and most populous city in the Western Balkans, we explored the city itself. We also explored some of the many wonderful museums and took day trips to the east and west of the city to explore more of Serbia and its history. There are over 50 museums in Belgrade, but we visited the National Museum, the Nikola Tesla Museum, the Museum of Yugoslavia and Hall of Flowers compound, and the House of Princess Ljubica, and the Serbian Orthodox Church Museum, which are across the street from each other. The Nikola Tesla Museum is a must for any geek, wannabe geek, or anyone interested in inventions or electricity. Of Serbian descent, born in Smiljan, Croatia in 1856, his father was a Serbian Orthodox priest. Unlike Catholic priests, Orthodox priests are usually married. Inventor and philosopher, Tesla is a national hero in most of the former Yugoslavia, but especially in Croatia and Serbia. The Science Museum in Zagreb and the Belgrade Airport are both named for him. Belgrade's Tesla Museum displays many of his inventions, large and small. Several are part of hands-on demonstrations that can only be done with a guided tour. We went in the morning and tours didn't start until afternoon, so we missed out. There's also a short film about his life and major achievements. One of which is the impact he had on the Niagara Falls hydroelectric plant. Nine of his overall 300 patents were used in building the plant, the first large-scale alternating current power plant that revolutionized how electric power was generated and transmitted, powering New York City from 500 kilometers away. The Museum of Yugoslavia and Hall of Flowers compound lies about three kilometers south of the old city, a long walk or an easy bus ride away. It's situated on a hill overlooking residential parts of the city. The sculpture out front is weirdly overgrown and filled with plastic bottles, even though most of the place seems well maintained. What looks like the main building is the May 25 Museum, which was closed for construction. The old museum is open to visitors. The entire compound is effectively a monument to the Yugoslav communist leader, Josip Tito. This prominent statue has him looking like a displeased father, maybe disappointed at what happened to his country after his death in 1980. The House of Flowers is Tito's mausoleum, with a memorial slab at the center. The two side chambers depict the many ways that people adored him, from Yugoslav citizens to world leaders, with a map showing how many countries were represented at his funeral. Much of the space is filled with batons from the annual Relay of Youth, a nationwide event where youth carry a baton around the country, culminating in a massive ceremony to present it to Tito on his birthday. The old museum building, ostensibly about the country, does have some displays about the history of the country and the fight against fascism in the 1940s, but most of it is about Tito. Photography was very restricted, but there are even more youth batons as well as gifts to Tito from foreign leaders through the years. Princess Ljubica Vukomenovic is the wife of Miloš Obrenovic, also known as Miloš the Great, Prince of Serbia from 1815 to 1839. The house is an excellent example of a 19th century Balkan aristocratic residence and represents the complexity of Serbia and the Obrenovic lifestyle at the time. With Serbia having been under Ottoman rule for centuries and still a vassal state, the house has many Ottoman characteristics not least of which is the furniture in many rooms. The prince was a philanderer and a tyrant who was ultimately deposed by their eldest son, Milan. The princess was a strong woman and politically active herself. 
she eventually forbade the prince from living in the house, taking it for her own. Other rooms are Western European in style. Prince Miloš led a Serbian uprising largely from a desire to gain some autonomy from the Ottomans and become more Western. The decor in these rooms show that aspiration. One story of the house is that the prince inserted one of his mistresses into the staff. When the princess found out, she was so enraged that she fatally shot the woman. The princess's clothes also reflect the cultural duality. Some are Ottoman in fashion and some European. The architecture of the house has some specific Ottoman design features. The two large sitting rooms, the divanhana on the ground floor and the divanhane above it are the most obvious. Traditionally, the more ornate ground floor room was for men to socialize and conduct business the upper floor reserved for women and the family, though one assumes that the princess made use of both. The princess's private chambers were also specifically Turkish. The furnishings do not include a bed. Instead, the sleeping mat is rolled up and stored in the large wall closet. The adjacent room is a true luxury, the private Turkish-style thermal bath or hammam. To heat the hammam and the rest of the house, Two large furnaces were put near the entrance. Modern radiators do that job today. The Serbian Orthodox Church Museum across the street, housed in the offices of the Serbian Patriarch, contains thousands of historical church artifacts, a couple hundred of which are on display. It also provides some history of the Serbian church, which was granted autocephalous or independent status by the Patriarch of Constantinople in 1219. Unlike Roman Catholicism, where the Pope is the sole Patriarch, Eastern Orthodoxy allows autonomy for large regional churches. The Byzantine Greek Patriarch is referred to for guidance, but not final authority. This is based on the Roman Tetrarchy implemented by pre-Christian Emperor Diocletian, where the administration was performed by a team of four equals. Diocletian's successor, Constantine the Great, both Christianized and realigned the empire into two equal halves based in Rome and Constantinople. Administration of the early Christian church then evolved into five equals, with the patriarchates of Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem all in equal standing to Rome and Constantinople. The 7th century Islamic conquests of the Middle East and Egypt left Rome and Constantinople the only patriarchs in Christian lands. The insistence by Rome that it be the sole authority, among other political and theological differences, finally led to the great schism between the Eastern and Western churches in 1054 that persists to this day. Over the centuries, the Bulgarian, Georgian, Romanian, Serbian, and Russian patriarchates have been added to the Orthodox community for a total of nine autocephalous Orthodox churches. There are many Serbian Orthodox churches in Belgrade. One of the most important is the Cathedral of the Archangel Michael, which faces the Serbian Orthodox Museum. Built in the early 18th century, its structure resembles a Western Catholic church with its single spire rising above the main building. The Church of St. Mark, by contrast, is in the Serbo-Byzantine revival style that began in the late 19th century. In 1690, the Serbian elite fled the Ottoman invaders to Austria and Orthodox traditions merged with Austrian Catholicism. The late 18th century revival aim to restore the older Byzantine traditions, including church architecture. St. Mark's was the largest Serbian Orthodox church until the Temple of St. Sava was consecrated in 2004. Still under construction, when completed it will become the new center of Serbian Orthodoxy.
built on the presumed gravesite of St. Sava, the first patriarch of the Serbian church, who also gave his name to the Sava River that runs through Belgrade, it replicates the dimensions and architecture of the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul with Serbian touches. The Hagia Sophia was the seat of the Constantinople Patriarchate and the greatest church in Eastern Christianity until 1453 when the Ottoman Turks conquered the city and converted it to a mosque. The National Museum in Belgrade, founded in 1844 and located in Republic Square, is a must-see for those interested in history, archaeology, or art. The art collections on the upper floors exhibit pieces by various Serbian artists from the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries. One temporary exhibition we saw presented different kinds of Serbian Orthodox iconographic art from different eras. For history buffs, the middle floors exhibit Serbian history with maps, charts, and text providing context to the accompanying art and artifacts. The ground floor is dedicated to archaeology of the Roman and earlier periods. The Roman collection is impressive, as large parts of Serbia were ruled by Rome for 600 years. This bust of Constantine the Great is significant as it's from his hometown of Nish, Naissus during Roman times. In total, 17 Roman emperors were born in the territory of modern Serbia second only to Italy. Three more from around Nish, including Constantine's father. Three were born in eastern Serbia. Jovian was born in modern-day Belgrade. And nine were born in northwestern Serbia, including Constantine's second son. Bronze Age artifacts are on display next to the Roman ones, primarily from northeastern Serbia. The most impressive, though, to us, was the Mesolithic Middle Stone Age exhibit from the Lipinski Vir archaeological site in eastern Serbia. Discovered in 1960, excavations were performed until 1971 when the downstream Iron Gate hydroelectric power station was set to be completed. Named for the primary discovery site, the culture extended up and down the Danube even north into Romania, with many sites discovered on both sides of the river. The primary settlement was dated between 9500 to 7200 BCE, making it one of the oldest, and possibly the oldest, permanent planned settlement in Europe. While many artifacts are displayed in the Belgrade Museum, a branch of the National Museum is located near the actual site in eastern Serbia. We took a day tour to see it. About 165 kilometers east of Belgrade, Lipinski Vir sits on the Serbian side of the Danube. Translated as Lepina Whirlpool, Lepina is the Serbian name for the nearby Danube tributary as well as the rock that overlooks the settlement. Prior to the construction of the Iron Gate Dam, Treacherous whirlpools were abundant in the Danube, so there must have been one nearby. The museum site is a relocated version of the original settlement that was flooded when the Iron Gate hydroelectric dam was completed in 1971. The colored paint on the sidewalls show the layers of dirt and time that were excavated by the project. A movie theater shows a film about the site's excavation. The largest of many similar sites, it shows amazing sophistication for a people who lived so long ago. The floors of what used to be houses are arranged in an organized fashion with different sizes according to different needs and uses. Streets allow for passage between them. The shape of the houses imitates the shape of the rock. It can only be guessed at whether this was for philosophical, religious, or more mundane reasons. 
The artifacts found of tools are practical and ornate, and the jewelry was also beautifully made. The materials some of them were made from indicate that these people traded with others downriver on the Danube all the way to the Black Sea. It's hypothesized that the statues were carved to resemble fish, honoring a major source of food for the villagers from the Danube. Grave sites were also found. Recreations are shown of three of the over 130 found in all the villages. Many times, new houses were laid on top of old houses and graves. About 35 kilometers upriver from Lipinski Vir, Gaudibat's fortress guards the entrance to the largest gorge in Europe, as it has for nearly 700 years. The Jurdap Gorge, or Iron Gate Gorge, is the narrowest stretch of the Danube, running 134 kilometers, splitting the Carpathian and Balkan mountain chains. Lake Jurdap, at the mouth of the gorge, is the widest stretch of the river, created by the Iron Gate Dam in 1971. The origins of the fortress are unclear. Hungarians, Bulgarians, and Serbs alternated control during the construction of the oldest parts of the fortress. The name of the fortress, Pigeon in Serbian, is more clear, as there are many birds who call the fortress home. The newest tower, Cannon Tower, was built in the 15th century to add greater firepower to the fort. Control of the fortress changed many times between Serbia, Hungary, and the Ottomans until the 19th century when the power of contemporary artillery rendered stone fortifications obsolete. The newest construction is an unfortunate road that bored a hole in the back of the fort in the 1930s. Restoration began in 2014 and it was open to tourists in April 2019, so it's been a popular pandemic era destination especially for locals. There's also a dock for Danube River cruise ships. An entrance ticket gets you access to most of the towers and all of the lower buildings. The upper walls require a separate ticket but unfortunately, they weren't sold to members of group tours. After touring Goljabats and Lipinski Vir, our group was really hungry. So the next stop at Kapitan Mission Breg was just the thing. Named for a local 19th century icon, it's billed as an eco-ethnic complex. Perched on a knoll overlooking the Danube 150 meters below, the views are spectacular and the meal they served, eaten under a grapevine-covered trellis, was phenomenal. Everything was a traditional dish, locally sourced, with all vegetables from the property, and the cheese milked from their own sheep. The most memorable items were the fried nettle leaves and fresh-baked, flaky pocket pastries filled with cheese, peppers, and cabbage. The price was $12 per person, including local Rhine and Rakia. The other trip we took out of Belgrade was 90 minutes northwest on a bus to Novi Sad, the second largest city in Serbia. The train and bus station is a bit far from the city center, but the architecture is pretty nice along the way. The main square has a beautiful Catholic cathedral, one of the few that we found in Serbia. The other landmark was Petrovaradin Fortress, a late 14th century Austrian castle overlooking the Danube. There's not much else to see in Novi Sad, and we found Zemun to be a much better change of scenery from Belgrade and only one-third of a commute. That wraps up our month-long stay in Belgrade, capital of Serbia. Some pointers we picked up from our time there include leverage the bus and tram system and buy a bus pass even for a week. Take advantage of the promenades along the Sava and Danube 
by bike if possible. Visit the museums and take the free walking tour to get oriented to the old town. If you have a kitchen, buy local, especially the Zemun Market and local wines in Rakia. We hope you enjoyed our explorations of Belgrade. If you did and want to see more from us, help out the channel by hitting like on the video and subscribe on our channel. Fala Vam!